Hi guys, welcome to chapter three of Boston Jane Wilderness Days. It is called The Most Disagreeable Man in the Territory. So, hmm, let me guess who would be the most disagreeable. We know how she feels about Mr. Russell. William is somewhere out there too. It could be William. I think William's my least favorite right now, but I wonder what your least favorite man in the book would be the most disagreeable man. Okay, let's see. So we left off where Mr. Russell like yanked her out of bed and walked her out of the cabin and said, you stink so bad, you need a bath and you can't come back until you have a bath. So that was pretty funny. All right, let's see where she goes from here. The next morning found me sitting on the rickety cabin porch, attempting to compose a letter to Papa's solicitor. It had continued to rain during the night and everything was damp. The ground had turned to mud and the sky was as gray as a chimney's sweep, sweeps hat. I don't know what that is. Oh, a chimney sweep is the person that sweeps the chimney, so their hat, yeah, that would be gray covered in soot. That makes sense, sorry. Another perfectly dreadful day on Shoalwater Bay. The men snoring had kept me up most of the night and every shrieking animal sound startled me. Even Brandywine's light waffling dog snores made me twitch and turn in discomfort. I had lain for hours staring at the ceiling of the cabin on my hard bunk, unease running through my blood like ice. I felt myself adrift in the world. Already motherless, I now had no father, no house to call home, and no kindly Mrs. Parker to dry my tears on her apron. I had nothing at all. A chunk of black chewed tobacco landed at my feet with a wet slap. Now that you're up, Mr. Russell announced, one gray whisker twitching, you can start mending again. He held aloft a crusty looking shirt with a torn sleeve. I had done the mending and some of, cook some of the cooking around Mr. Russell's cabin in exchange for my board. That means like when someone gives you a place to stay. Although considering the shabby conditions, it was clear that he was getting the better bargain. Is that all you care about? That you lost your seamstress? He shrugged. Well, I reckon I missed the cooking too. You don't have much of a hang for it, but I, I've had worse. I'm not your maid, I shouted. That don't shine with me. He pointed at me sharply. You work if you want a roof over your head. He flung the torn shirt at me, but I deliberately stepped back and watched it fall on the muddy ground. You're gonna have to wash it now too, you stubborn gal. And supper best be on the table tonight, he said. Then he shambled away. And make one of them pies, he added over his shoulder. I waited until he was out of sight before grabbing up the shirt and stomping into the cabin to prepare supper. I should make him a mud pie, I muttered to myself, sorely tempted to do just that. As I measured and sifted and stirred, I fumed. Mr. Russell was plainly the most disagreeable man in the entire territory. All right, so it was Mr. Russell. If you made a prediction that it was Mr. Russell, you were right. He was everything I despised in this foul, wet place. He spent every waking moment spitting his filthy tobacco. He guzzled whiskey and spoke in grunts, not to mention I was convinced he was the principal reason there were so many fleas in the cabin. He wouldn't know a good manner if it ran up the leg of his disgusting buckskin trousers and bit him. And to think that I had once considered him a good-hearted man? I had been fooled by his small kindnesses to me, such as the time the bar of lavender soap mysteriously appeared among my belongings shortly after Mr. Russell had returned from Astoria. But I saw the truth now. He was just a mean, selfish, ignorant man who cared for no one but himself. After all, what kind of man throws a young lady into the rain in little more than a woolen nightgown? What kind of a man? Are you trying to kill that doe? A voice asked mildly. I'll shoot it for you if you want me to put it out of its misery. It was Jehu. He took two long-legged strides over to the table and eyed my handiwork. I had been so consumed by my anger toward Mr. Russell that the pie crust I had been fashioning had been rolled flat as a pocket handkerchief. Blasted Mr. Russell. I muttered, gathering up the beaten dough and patting it back into a ball. Jehu dragged up a chair and watched me. Do you know that I have a bruise from where he dropped me on the porch? I exploded. Jehu's mouth turned up in a small grin. Really? Where? You're just as bad as him. 
There's not a single decent gentleman in the whole of this wretched territory. I see, flattening the dough again with the rolling pin, as if the act alone would smooth out all the wrinkles in my life. I hate this place. I don't even know why I'm here. I'll never be dry again, not to mention I'll never get a moment's sleep from all the snoring, and I haven't seen my father since he laid open my cheek with that horse harness, Jehu said quietly. My hands were still. He rubbed the thick, angry scar in his cheek. That was, well, nearly 10 years ago now. Don't really know for sure if he's even alive. His eyes met mine across the emptiness of the cabin and I felt myself bite back tears. Oh, Papa. Just then the door banged open. It was Karukso. Remember that is Handsome Jim. This is not a barn, I shouted, my grief turning to fury in a rush. The two men exchanged a look and Karukso closed the door carefully, then sat down on a bench near Jehu. Karukso meant crooked nose in Chinook. As was the Chinook custom, he had changed his name after some of his family had died in the summer outbreak. The Chinook believed that the ghosts of the dead can't haunt you if you change your name. Still, in my mind, he would always be the name I first knew him by and which suited him so well, Handsome Jim. For you, for you see, he was truly the most handsome young man I had ever been acquainted with in my entire life. He had long, thick black hair, lovely eyes, and a muscled body. He was also a kind, sweet friend who always managed to make me laugh. Well, usually he did, for I found nothing amusing about him reaching into the bowl of berries I had set aside for the pie. I slapped his hand away. So my question to you is, do you think she has a crush on Handsome Jim? Jehu rolled his eyes. Miss Russell say you cook pie, Boss and Jane, Karukso said, looking affronted. Sorry, Sophie's sing singing Paw Patrol. Oh, did he? I asked in a tight voice. Jane's a little frustrated with Mr. Russell right now, Jehu explained helpfully. Frustrated, I huffed. Frustrated is living in a cabin where fleas are permanent residents. Frustrated is being... Frustrated is being surrounded by filthy snoring strangers. Frustrated is being stuck in this infernal wilderness where it never stops raining. Believe me, I am frustrated by a great many things, but Mr. Russell is not one of them. So if you're not frustrated, what are you? Jehu asked, reaching for a berry. I grabbed the overworked gray lump of dough and flung it in the men's general direction. Oh my gosh, just threw the dough at them. It struck Jehu's chest with a thump before landing on Karukso. Is this pie? Karukso asked, an astonished look on his face. Yes, it's the blasted pie, I shouted and stomped to the door of the cabin. And for your information, Mr. Scudder, I'm not frustrated with Mr. Russell. I paused for effect. I'm furious. And with that, I slammed the cabin door and practically ran down the path alongside the slender stream that led to the Chinook village, my blood racing. I passed by Father Joseph's small chapel and saw him raise a hand in greeting, but I didn't stop. I kept walking fast, my heart pounding, and it wasn't until I saw the large wooden buildings rising from the trees that I felt my heart slow down to a reasonable thump. Chief Toke's village consisted of several large cedar lodges. The lodges were quite comfortable dwellings and much more spacious, not to mention cleaner than the pioneer cabins. As I entered the village, I saw the Chinooks going about their daily duties. They were a copper-skinned people with thick black hair. Some of them, like Sudi, had slanted foreheads from having been placed in a cradle board as a baby. A slanted forehead was a mark of distinction. The men wore the same style of clothes as the pioneers, although some of the older men wore blankets. In addition to wearing calico dresses, the women sometimes wore skirts constructed of strips of twisted cedar bark. Some of the Chinook shouted my name in greeting, Boss and Jane! Although I was from Philadelphia, the Chinooks referred to the Americans as Boston Tillicums or Boston people, as the first American ships to arrive on the bay were from Boston. I discovered Sudi finally behind one of the lodges with two boys ensconced in a game. The little girl had often turned to me for comfort in the weeks following her mother's death, but now I found that our roles were reversed. From the grin on Sudi's face, it was clear to see she was holding her own with the two lads, who I should say looked particularly annoyed. One of the boys stood up and walked away in disgust. He was followed a moment later by the other boy, who had a rather dejected expression on his face. You won, Sudi? I asked. A bright smile wreathed her face. Boss and Dean! 
What did you win? I crouched down next to her, surveying the small pile of treasures. Sudi held up pretty smooth stones, glass beads, and a glossy black feather. I admired them dutifully and couldn't help but notice that her face had the same satisfied look that her mother's had had when she'd made a good trade. Okay, one minute, baby. The Chinooks were great traders and wealth was a sign of status. The Tai, or chief, was generally the wealthiest person. She displayed a piece of purple velvet that she had also won. Will you make me a new dress for Dolly? Sudi asked, tugging at the blue calico fabric of my dress. Like your Boston dress? I nodded, I believe I can do that. Sudi pointed to my collar with a critical eye. With that too? Very well. And this, she added, touching the scallop of lace at my wrist. I laughed. You should be a fashion editor for Godie's ladies book. What is that, she asked. That is a lady who thinks about dresses all day. Oh yes, she said happily. I stood up, extending my hand. Shall we go back to your lodge and get started on this new wardrobe? She gathered her treasures into her skirt. Then she put her small trusting hand in mine and together we walked to her lodge. The cedar lodge was quite large and we entered it by slipping through an opening near the ground. Fire pits lined the center of the lodge and cedar planks that could be shifted to allow smoke to escape served as the roof. A roof. The Chinooks often laid salmon on a grid of poles beneath the ceiling in order to smoke the fish. A very clever idea in my opinion. Huge bunk-like structures, platforms really, were built along the interior walls and it was upon these that families lived. Rush mats lined the floors, which proved very handy in keeping the dust down. I had adopted the Chinook method. Okay, one second, sweetie. Of using mats in the cabin, and though the dust was less of a problem, the men still helpfully tromped in huge bootfuls of caked mud. It was fair to say that Chief Toke's tidy lodge was a vast improvement on Mr. Russell's cabin. It was nearly supper time, and there were men gathered around the fire roasting salmon. The sight of men preparing supper for their families still surprised me after all these months, although it was quite usual for the Chinooks. So she's shocked that the men are doing the cooking because we know that during this time period, the women would be the ones cooking in the um, American, um, you know, the way she was raised, like in Philadelphia. I was startled to see Mr. Russell conferring with Chief Toke on a platform at the other end of the lodge. The kindly chief very much reminded me of a judge in Philadelphia who had been one of Papa's friends with Papa. Thought you were supposed to be fixing supper, gal, Mr. Russell said loudly. I opened my mouth to say I had no intention of fixing supper for such a disagreeable man when Sudi piped up in a clear voice, Boss and Jane is making a dress for my dolly. Well, hurry it up, Mr. Russell said. I want supper ready before sundown. Sudi took a protective step in front of me and marched right up to Mr. Russell, utterly fearless, and waved the piece of velvet in his face. You make supper, Sudi said with a firm little shake of her head. Mr. Russell looked taken aback. I stifled a laugh and Chief Toke's dark eyes filled with mirth at his brave little daughter, so very like his late wife. I love you. Okay, one second, baby. Mr. Russell shook his head in a bewildered way and then looked at me, Riley. Well, you heard her, gal. Go on and make this little girl a dress. I reckon I'll be fixing supper. Sudi shot me a triumphant look. I reckon you will, Mr. Russell, I said, and smiled right back at my small defender. So, <laughs> interesting. So what is your opinion of who do you, hold on, so who do you think is right? Is is Jane? It's Sophie and Mommy. It is Sophie and Mommy. Is Jane being a little spoiled? She wants to live for free in Mr. Russell's cabin and not have to work for it? Should he just naturally provide her with dinner and a home and all of those things? Or <laughs> or do you feel Mr. Russell's right? Should she have to work and make dinner? He would. He wants her to cook and he wants her to sew and wash the clothes. So what's your opinion? Who do you think is, is um, being fair? Um, I don't know. And, and do you think he's being like, is he being mean and demanding or does he have the right to do that? I wish I could have that conversation with you guys. All right, until we meet again for chapter four next time. Thanks for joining. Bye-bye.